Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Petronas Podcast. This is episode 68. This is part two of the double header with my guest, Dr. John Constable. If you remember from last week or episode 67, um, we talked at length about energy insecurity and what was going on within the UK, Europe, energy policies, and the, the track that the US was going down. And so this is part two with Dr. Con- Dr. Dr. John Constable. It is a a relatively long conversation, so I broke it up into two episodes. Um, Really fantastic conversation. And in this this podcast, we get into China, we get into geopolitics, we get into the leverage that China has if if the U.S. um, is spending so much money on renewables and spending so much money on the economy and not getting a lot of energy output from it. Um, We also talk about the need for education, energy illiteracy, something that John calls uh, energy blindness. Um, And I just want to, you know, I'll timestamp this and we'll get into the market in a second, but this was a, a, a podcast that I did because Chris Wright had said, hey, you should have this guy on your podcast. Um, Chris also had him give a talk. He was in Denver giving a talk and Chris posted that talk online. So if you go on LinkedIn, you can see that. So if you want to know more about you know the premise behind this, we talk about this a lot in episode 67. We're talking about it in this podcast, but the the point that John is making with this, the Inflation Reduction Act is really the cost and how much this is, what this is going to mean to the U.S. economy and the fact that it's not giving us a lot of energy um, and really also the leverage this is giving to China. So a lot going on with that. I really hope you guys um, take a listen and really look forward to your feedback. The feedback on the first one has been fantastic. So with that, I will explain and timestamp it that today is Tuesday, um, December 13, 2022, but this was recorded on November 29, 2022. And at the time of recording, we've lost a little footing, but not too much. We've gained it back. At the time of recording, Brent was 8306, WTI was 7739. Now, fast forward that a couple of weeks, I have been to Oxford and London, saw John actually again in London. I've um, had some fantastic meetings in London, met with folks at the Bank of England, you know, had a, a ton of conversations with taxi drivers in London and Oxford, which were extremely telling on the state of the economy. And it was getting really really, really cold. And this is the first cold snap they really had because they had a pretty unseasonably warm fall. Um, and the, I think that has really given um, they both Europe and, and the UK um, a very intense fall sense of security. Um, so right now, as of December 13, 2022, we are looking at WTI at 79.39. That We have seen some significant footing and recovery in oil prices because we saw a lot of deterioration. Um, lots going on with China, which I'm going to get into in just a second. Um, but Brent is 80.51. 80, oh, 80, Nat Gas Henry Hub right now is 6.94. We have seen some recovery in that with a big winter storm and cold snap in the U.S. as well. And we're seeing Dutch TTF at 43 bucks. So we have seen some uptick in prices in Dutch TTF, Nat Gas prices as well. And if you look at U.K. electricity prices, Prices and German electricity prices, they are way back. So we, you know, if you're looking at before we had this energy crisis and the run up to the energy crisis, it, you were looking at sort of 80, 80 pounds per megawatt hour in, in the UK. That was July of 2021. If you look in Germany, you were looking about under, under 80 euro per megawatt hour as well. Now you are looking at 400 pounds per megawatt hour in the UK as of right now. And you were looking at about 443 euros per megawatt hour in Germany. And since in that time, you've seen, you see, we've seen some massive price spikes. And this is extremely rel- relevant to the conversation I had in the in this podcast, and the previous one with, with John on, on everything going on within Europe and what could be happening in the US. So when you see these prices spike, we that is the run up in from 2021 um, all through these price spikes. And so we had they had well over 500 pounds per megawatt hour multiple on multiple occasions in December of last year, in September of this year um, and 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 in de- early December as of December 6th and has come down a little bit. So I would say when we're talking about Europe and we're talking about Britain and we're talking about the winter and we're talking about, you know, these nat- natural gas storage levels, which everyone was really excited about. I think we have to be very, very cautious about that because like I said, they're just now getting the colder weather and they're drawing down on those net gas inventories um, and they're using it. And so we are seeing those price spikes accordingly. Now, I do think it's important to explain oil prices have got some footing back. And a lot of that is based on today on Tuesday, December 13th, is that we had the inflation reading. OK, so we had the inflation read. It came in lower than expected, which is a positive sign. There were a lot of 
some positive elements in there, a lot of not so positive elements in there. And then we have the Fed talking tomorrow, uh, Fed going to raise rates uh, tomorrow, expected they're probably going to raise rates rates 50 basis points. If they don't, if they raise it less, that'll be extremely dovish for the market. Um, and if they if they raise it higher, obviously that would be hawkish. We're looking at sort of 50 basis points. Now, the reason why they're going to have to raise rates and they can't just say, hey, we're done, is because the inflation read, and we'll get back into oil prices in just a second, and we'll talk about um, we'll talk about China, and we'll, we'll close on talking about a little bit on the UK as well. Um, but if you look at U- US inflation, we went from 7.1% um, last month to, uh, or sorry, the current read is 7.1%. That core number, you know, minus food and inflation, less food and inflation is 6%. Um, we're looking, the problem is we, and we were at 7.7%. So we've, you know, we've, We've dropped nearly half a, over half a percentage point, so that is positive. We're looking at food at home prices, or food at home inflation has come down twelve to um, has has come down from twelve to eleven percent. We're looking at food overall from eleven point four percent to. 10.6%. So we haven't seen a massive drop in food. And uh, the food away from home is we're looking, we're still looking at um, 8.5%. So we're still seeing really high, you know, double digit inflation levels on the food side. So that's really important. Now, if that's coming down, but it really needs to come down for consumers to feel it. And the, the, the reason why the Fed is likely going to and has to continue to raise rates is because some of this is sticky. We had some positive jobs data that came out last week, you know, in the past couple of weeks, a little better than expected and higher higher wages on that side. So that's that's important. And I know folks want to interpret that positively that, hey, folks are getting paid more. That's not really positive because everything's driving up those costs with it. And if you want to hire somebody, you have to pay them more as well. And that impacts businesses. So there, everything trickles, um, it trickles down, but also trickles up and, and, and into each other. So when you're, when folks are having, we're having stickier wage price inflation, we're going to have stickier inflation because, um, that's just how it works. Now, when we look at, where we're at for um, what actually dropped for inflation, it was energy. Um, and that makes sense, right? We are produ- There's a, something we need to talk about, which is U.S. production. Um, but we also need to just talk about the fact that global production is um, and demand, supply and demand um, is a little bit out of whack. The fact that we're seeing, you know, south of, um, we're looking $80 Brent. We saw under $80 Brent in the past, in last week and over the weekend. So really serious stuff in terms of recession risk and recession fears and demand erosion um, because of the economy, because the health of the economy. So gasoline prices were down, natural gas prices were down. But the really big takeaway of why the Fed is going to have to continue to raise rates is shelter. Um, And that went from 6.9% actually up to 7.1%. So that has not come down. And that is a really tricky part of this this ball game, and something I, I I spend time in presentations and talking with clients is that shelter or rental prices or your your, your what we're paying to live um, has gone way up. And if you talk to anyone on the rental side, you're seeing some serious compression in terms of how people are living. So you're seeing younger people move in with their folks. You're seeing couples move in with their folks. You're seeing you know people consolidate and lots of folks moving in together. Um, and this is stuff that we we we've seen in other recessions, but that's because rental prices are just so high. And then. The problem with that is that the mortgage rates are still really high. So if we're looking at, yes, we've seen the 10-year yield come down and the 10-year yield is kind of hovering around 3.5% and we're looking at the 30-year mortgage around 6.4, 6.38%, it's still really high. It's come off of the highs of over 7%. But that means it hasn't come down. I mean, it hasn't come down. So w- w- not enough to actually impact one prices and the incentive for somebody to buy. So the actual monthly payment that folks are making are is if they were to buy a house now is significantly higher. And the problem is when it's several hundred dollars a month more than it was previously, people are not qualifying for mortgages. So you're just it's not seeing homes sell. Definitely, we've seen prices come down. We're seeing if you look on Bloomberg and all kinds of other news sources, you're seeing UK prices come down. I certainly heard um, talk about the real estate side from taxi drivers in London as well. I spent my entire ride from from my hotel to the airport flying out on talking about UK prices of, of homes and what was going on with the real estate market in the UK. Um, but I think we really need to talk about oil prices. And, you know, we saw that really significant drop. We saw some, we've seen, a, you know, a few buck recovery in oil prices. So the 75 level back to $80 Brent, so starting to see some footing there. But we have seen the Saudis actually cut oil prices to Asia. So we know if the Saudis are doing that, we know that there's problems within the, we know that there's problems within the oil space. And so let's talk about those problems a little bit. I think there's overall concern about the economy. We're definitely seeing weakness. We are hearing, we're hearing um, notes of, 
if you're listening to BBC, you hear about folks in the UK talking about their Christmas markets not performing. I can tell you it was bananas in Oxford. Um, at Oxford and London, it was going crazy. Everybody was out doing everything. And there was definitely sort of this sort of pent up feeling of and what the taxi drivers were explaining was they have had their best years that they've ever had. There was a massive amount of post COVID pent up demand. And they really thought that, hey, there might be some decent spending over the course of Christmas. But then they thought that would really come off a cliff in January because people just so overstretch. And you have to understand that also in the UK and many parts of the world, they do not have 30 year fixed rate mortgages. They have, I think a maximum is like five years where it's fixed. So a lot of these mortgages are coming due with higher interest rates, meaning their monthly payments, their monthly, you know, costs that they're paying are going up massively. That's in addition to very already across the board inflation and very high electricity prices and energy prices. So super, super serious. Secondly, and I'm not going to get into this too much on U.S. production because the uh, talk that I gave at Oxford Institute for Energy Studies in Oxford was on U.S. shale production. And I did record that. It is a short 15-minute presentation, but it went really well. I um, So I recorded that and I will be turning that into a podcast and I'll front load that with more talk on U.S. production. But that being said, I will just say that it is really important to understand where production levels are at and what and where price levels are at. So the U- U.S. production is absolutely crushing it. We are at 12.3 million barrels per day for oil production. And yes, that is down from the high, you know, the record high in 2019 of 13 million barrels per day. Um, but actually, when we include natural gas liquids, we are at eight, over 18 and a half million barrels a day of production. So that is an absolute record high. It had just touched 18 million barrels a day when we were looking at those that that 13 million barrel day high mark in November or, or sorry, in 2019. Now, the reason why is because we have all this natural gas liquids. And so we have an unprecedented situation where we have the rise of these private operators and we have high natural gas prices and high natural gas liquids prices. And we really have not seen strength in net gas prices over the course of the shale revolution. So I think it's extremely important to appreciate how um, that has changed the dynamics. And so we are producing, uh, we are, uh, gross withdrawals of, of, of natural gas is over 120 billion cubic feet per day. We're nearing 121 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas in the U.S. That is over a quarter of the 400 BCF a day global supply and demand market. That is just huge, Um, absolutely huge to think about. So really important. We're also exporting, including natural gas liquids, crude oil, um, diesel, you know, refined product and everything. We're exporting over 10 million barrels a day. So the U.S. is by far and away a massive, massive powerhouse in oil and gas production. And I say this and I emphasize it because you just don't hear it anywhere. You don't hear it on Bloomberg, you don't hear it on CNBC, you don't hear it on, at, on the at Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, you certainly don't hear it out of the, this administration of the White House. So it's really important to understand um, because that gives the U.S. significant amount of leverage. And it's also important why this conversation upcoming is really important to understand is that, you know, we, we do have this capacity of producing a lot and we are using a lot of natural gas in our grid. Okay, so lastly, I'm going to say before getting into this presentation, we're going to talk about China really quickly. Um, I think it's really important to think of the context of oil prices being really weak in the backdrop in the backdrop of the craziness of the COVID measures going on within China. So we had zero COVID, and then zero COVID has turned was turned into dynamic zero COVID, and now it's sort of all bets are off, and they're opening up. Well. That opening up is a bit of question. So we have, they, they've reduced the amount of testing. Um, so they've lifted testing requirements in many places. There is a flood of folks going into clinics and fever clinics and um, hospitals. And the government of China is actually asking people not to do that and saying, hey, COVID's actually not that big a deal. You're probably not going to die. And that's a pretty serious flip from what they said before and the dynamic in the you know, zero COVID measures. That all being said is that you would think that um, oil prices would have popped and that everybody would be getting out and going crazy. The problem is that China has done a pretty good job of making their population extremely fearful of the virus. Um, And now people are actually getting sick. So there's a fear. Um, You do have a higher percentage of the elderly population that is not vaccinated um, and they don't have the mRNA vaccines. They're using Chinese vaccines. And so it, this is a, a, a messy, messy situation. Um, but it's important to think about in the context of oil prices. And I think a big portion of that is that you do still have tens of millions of people under lockdown. So not everyone just went out of lockdown and was lifted immediately. Um, and I think I mentioned before with that, the fire in Urumqi and the subsequent protests and everything we saw, we saw that the province of Xinjiang was under lockdown. And that is the province with, with forced labor and internment camps and abuse. But that province was under lockdown for over 100 days. So there's a, there's a lot of dynamics at play with China. I think just like the overall stock market, when you can, you, we just have, 
the, the bulls in the market want the market to rally. Okay. So every time there's a, you know, th this good news on the inflation data or bad news on the economy, they view the bulls view that positively. And then the stock market goes higher. That wasn't quite clear today and what they were doing. The problem is obviously, as we talked about inflation, the Fed's going to have to continue to raise rates because of things like food and shelter, et cetera. Now within China, it's kind of the same is that people are looking for these data points and they want it to rally. And I would say that, you know, everybody's calling for a bottom in the property sector. Um, and folks are saying, you know, they're going to get more stimulus that be very, very cautious of that. Cause I don't think the political environment has not changed in China. Um, the support that the politicians may give, um, the property sector is one thing, but that means you're just adding debt upon debt because there has not been a, a real fallout in the property sector. So with that, I really hope you guys, uh, enjoy this, this, con this part two of this conversation with, with John Constable. We had a fun time with this. Um, and, uh, next podcast we'll be dropping is the one where I'm in Oxford. Um, and we'll be talking all about you or shale. It, it's going to be great. And I will front load it by talking about the market as well. So talk to you soon folks. Bye. This is part two of the Petronas podcast with Dr. John Constable. Um, so returning uh, to this conversation and okay. So you mentioned two things just now from the, the finishing of that cover or that, that comment is the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S., which um, I love that you bring that up and you, you get into that and you talk about it on podcasts and you mention it. And I think it's extremely important for, for folks and listeners to understand. But w and I agree with you that we wouldn't we're not going to have just expecting just sort of this awakening. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of folks in uh, you hear people in the oil and gas industry, but but in general, very intelligent folks saying, you know, folks are just going to have to experience this economic pain for them to sort of wake up. I think uh, so. One of the questions on, on European policy is that, and something I, I get very frustrated with is people say, okay, well, they're importing all this LNG, and I don't see long-term contracts being signed. And it seems to me that in Europe, um, you know, when France wanted to call this fossil gas, um, you know, that was very frustrating to begin with. Now, maybe the rhetoric has changed slightly because everyone knows they, they need the natural gas. Um, I, I think there needs to be a little more education in Europe and, and in general of how much gas is actually consumed, how much was coming from Russia. I also believe that Europe thought that they were going to continue, the war would sort of subside, and then they would just get more gas from, from Russia, and they would keep outsourcing their CO2 emissions mm -hmm. and pretend that everything was just great, and we'll pretend to be green, even though we're not, and it costs a fortune. And lots of people are going to get rich, but you know, it, no one it will really pay attention. And I think the Russians have changed the game on that and sabotaged their own pipelines. And the, the gas probably isn't coming back. The war is probably going to be prolonged. This is going to be messy. You know, whether they're winning or not, it's not a good situation, which means that Europe will have to get more natural gas from the U.S. Or make a distressed return to coal. Or is, make a distressed return to coal. Which is not improbable now, and not, actually. Not improbable. And that's the other thing with coal. I mean, that's a very good point, um, is that so sometimes I think it's always not a, a, a actual turn on energy policies. It's we even have a turn, you know, in, in France or Germany, although they're bringing out all the mothballed coal fired power generation mm. that they had, they brought them back online. The fact that you are green economies and the moment, I mean, the reason we had the first price spike in crude oil was because everybody in Europe stopped burning natural gas and started burning diesel um, because they need, to, because it was less expensive. That that's that's a chain, an actual change. It's not a shift in energy policy, even though the emissions are going through. People the roof. do what they have to do. Exactly, and yeah. so energy is interesting for me from coal to standpoint. And I say this is, you know, and I. I'm, my family is, is is crude oil, you know, wheat and, and coal, and you know I completely understand that coal has a higher CO2 emissions and and pollution and everything, and we can get into what China is doing and why CO2 emissions is just completely irrelevant. But in Europe, and particularly, is that anywhere in the world, coal is very stable. It is a very energy secure resource. If you can yeah. produce it, you can put it on trucks, you can stack it up next to your power plants. You don't have to put this in a pipe. You don't. You can easily put it on a ship. You don't have to compress it. I mean, it's the energy security factor, I think, is really, really huge. And as economies get into more trouble and, you know, geopolitical volatility increases, coal just becomes that much more sexy and appealing for any country who doesn't give a rat's behind about, um, about CO2 emissions. And even if they do, they still want to turn the lights on for the people so they're not running. So I, I'm very curious in terms of, I know we're not waiting for this, this sort of awakening and come to Jesus moment, but there's stuff actually happening on the ground. Yeah. And it's predictable, in fact, from the uh, simple cost benefit analysis of the renewables and climate mitigation policies in Europe. If you look at the cost of abatement, that's the cost of reducing the emission, uh, preventing the emission of a tonne of carbon dioxide, and the social cost of carbon, monetized estimate of the harm to human welfare, net present value, from releasing that ton of carbon dioxide, you find that it is much more expensive to abate that ton than the harm to human welfare. So the cost exceeds 
the threat of climate change. We're taking chemotherapy for a cold, in effect. Now, that won't necessarily manifest itself as a change in policy, because as we know, governments never, by definition, make mistakes, do they ever? Right. right? So they're not going to admit they were wrong about it. But what that calculation tells us is that the climate policies actually are a more severe threat to human welfare than the climate change that they claim to prevent. That suggests that human behavior will actually resist these policies. They will actually fight right. back that they will adopt thermodynamically competent fuels in order to protect the interests of themselves and their families. And that is pretty much what we're seeing at the moment, actually. There is a distress return to fossil fuels. At the moment, uh, it's... Uh, distress return, that's a good dis term. Distress right? return. I mean, yep. it's very difficult to do, particularly because so many people are now chasing natural gas, and they will start to chase coal around the world right. as well. Uh, it's all uh, quite obvious. And again, totally predictable, these are high-grade fuels. Right. Of course people are going to use them. Uh, it, it's perfectly obvious that they will. And the difficulty the Europeans have is that they now have such large fleets of renewables that their demand on the, in the electricity generation fleets varies across all timescales, you know, from seconds through to decades. So it's difficult for them to engage in long-term contracts to obtain secure supplies of natural gas or indeed other fossil fuels one imagines um, in coal too. But they're not engaging in those long-term contracts they're in the name the of their policies no. and we we need those long-term contracts to get the infrastructure up and built in the US to and, get that. And to keep the prices down for consumers. Exactly, exactly. Yes. So one of the stabilization uh, policy readjustments that has to take place in Europe is the unwinding of the renewables fleets. Now you'll know that uh, reality has begun to dawn when the renewables capacities start to fall, because that shows that yes, that they, they, right. the systems have begun to respond, they're trying to stabilize uh, demand for the thermodynamically competent fuel or fuels that are actually guaranteeing security of supply and therefore enabling them to plan further into the future, both for you know, actually extracting those fossil fuels and obtaining longer term contracts. There's no sign of that yet. The European Union remains entirely committed to more renewables, and the government in London uh, has currently gone very green uh, indeed and is promising even more renewables, although it's renewables which have caused a large part of the current difficulties actually by overexposing right. to natural gas. So much of it is, is counterproductive uh, at present. Will it change in the near future? Well, as you said, I think it will change when people have no other option, actually. Uh, and that moment may not be so very far off now. In fact, in the UK we can't go back to coal because our uh, Secretary of State for Energy actually went around blowing up coal stations to show how green he was. Um, so they're gone uh, completely. No, we're but you could, get it from, you could get it from the US. You could get it build, from we, we have to build new coal stations to, right. manage to burn it, and we just don't have very many, many left. We, we use hardly any coal in the right. UK at all. No, you're very, you, you have, I believe it's 40% gas is the grid it's, and 30%, 38% renewable, which is... Well, yeah. but, but that's that's on a good day for renewables. Right, I, that's on a good day for renewables. Exactly. So right now, if you looked, if you went on to uh, BM reports in the UK at the moment, so you'd see that there's almost no wind generation at all. We have huge wind fleets. Yep. You know, nearly 30 gigawatts of wind. It's almost zero yep. at the moment. So natural gas is doing all the, the work today. And of course, biomass. We have quite a lot of biomass, which are oh, crypto, you, crypto just, coal stations. I, and Americans should be very interested in this because we're burning 25 million US trees from the Carolinas and other wow. places in order to supply dispatchable generation. These are- Is that in pellet, uh, like- In pelleted form. Yeah, yeah. pelleted. So that, that was the other thing. If you if you go back into the, the UK government reports, they talk about the biomass increasing and it's like, you're burning wood. Um, yeah. So, you know, you, th which is not from an emissions, from an emission standpoint, makes no sense, but they, they lump it into the renewable. So that's a very good, that's a very good point in terms of- um, Well, as I say, they're crypto coal. They're actually coal stations. Um, so they supply, uh, all the valuable services to the electricity network which a coal station does. They've got plenty of inertia, they're quite responsive, actually, they're very nice. And you said they, they are, in a little sense, they're the key enabler for the wind and solar policy. Right. If we weren't burning all those American trees, we wouldn't be able to have quite as much uh, American <laughs> wind and solar that we actually do. Um, should we be burning them? Well, as you say, the thermal efficiency is much lower, so their stack emissions of carbon dioxide per megawatt hour right. generated are higher, right. actually. This is only carbon neutral. Uh, if you accept all the stories about sustainable harvesting and replanting right. here in the right. US. And, well, uh, let's just say that there's a lot of debate about whether that's actually true. Well, yeah. And I'm frank, you know, personally, I don't believe a word of it. Uh, and then yeah. you have to actually put it on a ship and, and do that. But yeah. can, so one, I mean, there's a, there's a couple topics I want to get into. And that's, um, so you're explaining all this. And so I, I kind of want to know if, you know, is education and people just understanding, and people and, and policymakers and folks like us who are, you know, just getting on the mic and, and beating the drum of, 
you know, this is what's actually happening here, the actual numbers, and the, these are the facts. Yes. Um, so there's, there's that point, but I want to back up a little bit, and I think, I don't think a lot of people understand conversion, uh, meaning that as you're talking about, you know, we're getting, yes, we create wind and solar, now, they've never been economic. We know that from the start. Mm -hmm. um, you can subsidize the crap out of it, and people can say, okay, w what's the benefit of that? But p I think what people, a lot of folks don't realize is that as you're converting that energy and it finally gets to your home, you're losing, what you've been explaining is that you lose a ton of it. You lose a ton of energy. Um, and then you have very little energy left. And so you're paying, you're not just, you're massively paying for it. It's already expensive to begin with. You know, China mm. has subsidized it with forced labor and everything. But so there's lots of issues. You've used coal to actually make the solar panels. You finally get it to, to Europe and then they're using it. And then the conversion factor, by the time the energy gets into your home, you've lost a lot of energy. Yep. And that's a really serious thing of that, you know, if you're shoving these into the grid and, and half your grid, you know, in some of these places, is, is you know if, if a good chunk of your grid is solar then you just your conversion factor and if your chunk of your grid is wind, wind then your conversion factor by the time the energy gets into your home it's a lot less and it's so it's no. costing a it's costing way more than people realize that's right and, and you're only talking about the quantity there. the quantities are not of course the end of the story um, the really key metric here is actually the quality of the energy absolutely quality so the, yes yes so this, this takes us this into some think about again. BTUs and, and gas well, yeah. yes Quantities are one thing, they're very important, uh, and you're quite right, there are a lot of losses in a renewable system, and particularly because so much of it's connected at low voltage in the distribution network where the losses are quite high. But think about the entropy of the overall system. So with a, a, a fossil fuel system, you've got a very low entropy input, it's very high quality, so it can pay for the conversion, the burning, and the capital equipment, the transmission system, and the delivery system to consumers. It is all paid for in the very high quality of the fuel. It's self-supporting and indeed self-reproducing. Think again about renewables. You've got a very low quality, high entropy input. That has to be corrected to deliver the high quality, low entropy service that consumers actually want. So there is an inflow of negative entropy which is correcting the defect of the renewable energy technologies. Where is that coming from? It's coming from several sources. It's coming from the complexity of the solar panels and the wind <coughs> turbines. It's coming from the intense grid network which has to be built to support them. It's coming from all the complex grid mechanisms which have to be introduced, batteries and demand control and demand flexibility and all these sorts of clever little tricks right. that the ESOs will be, electricity system operators will be invoking in order to handle. So these are all corrective methods. They're high cost in financial terms and of course they have uh, a, a, a penalty in terms of the quantities of energy as well. But the really key thing here <coughs> is that you're applying hugely complex capital equipment to correct the right. defects. So in, in, from a thermodynamic point of view, you could say they're part of the fuel. It's not the wind and the solar you're consuming, it's the complexity in all the capital equipment that you've now forced into the system. Right. You've got a very low productivity system. It's not sustainable, dread word, it's not sustainable. You can't <coughs> go on doing this because in fact you're reliant on a high quality fossil fuel system somewhere, not necessarily in your part of the world, it could be in Asia, right to provide all this negative right. entropy inflow. This is not actually a self-supporting system and it will not endure. I realize that this is quite a complex sort of argument, but it's completely conclusive for anybody who really gets it. Absolutely, I know, and I think you can, I mean, I always think of, um, it, it is a complex argument, but it, it all is interrelated. And I think it's sort of like, um, I mean, it comes down to, you have an input and I, I always think about it, it's like shale gas. <coughs> Apologies for the dry cough, um, it's not COVID. Uh, so you have it like shale gas, different BTUs, right? I mean, mm -hmm. propane has my natural gas in my home doesn't have as much as high of BTU content as propane. That propane burns hotter. You know, if mm -hmm. I'm a fire pit outside at a bar, that burns hotter. Whereas I'm in my house, that that or outside my fire pit has a natural gas line. It's not quite as hot. Doesn't have the same BTUs. Um, and I always say, you know, these energy companies, particularly in the U.S., which do need to have criticism, is that you know we have all these CEOs that have jumped onto the net zero bandwagon, which is the <coughs> everything that the IEA has done, and I think it's just the wrong thing to do. Um, you know, they're talking about adding Exxon and Chevron and, and their lower carbon fuels and they're adding more solar and wind and, and different things like that. Not not necessarily crazy on double down solar wind, but all this low carbon stuff. And to me, sometimes you have to realize lower carbon means lower energy, lower BTU, lower output. And that is an ESG to me, is an ESG crisis in and of itself and something that drives me absolutely bananas. And I guess that's where this comes to me of the education standpoint in Europe of, you know, this, this is ESG, this is environmental, social and governments. No one cares about anything but the E and the CO2 emissions, which is simply we're outsourcing them to China and elsewhere. 
elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So we haven't reduced global CO2 emissions at all. Um, you've reduced them in Europe, but they've increased elsewhere. <clears throat> so is, is energy or like is education, you know, is there a role for, I, I think people go back and forth, the energy industry, oil and gas goes mm -hmm. back and forth on whether education can really help. And I'm at the point now where I really do think it can help because you have to have a starting point. You know, knowledge is power. And I just think that it is extremely important yeah. that we have to start somewhere is that, no, not all education is going to work, but but this industry needs to advocate for itself. And, yes, it and does. energy it, it, it needs, needs to fight. I mean, the, right. the, yes, the, the, the high quality sector, the fossil fuel sector has protested a little bit and it's resisted a little bit, but it has yet to begun to fight and it's really time to do so. Right. Will education work? Well, as I um, suggest in that paper written with uh, Deborah Lieberman, Professor Lieberman at the University of Miami, you know, human beings are not cognitively well equipped to understand the concept of energy. So before we start trying to educate the public and decision makers about this, we have to face the fact that the human mind, and not just you know, decision makers, but you and I, Trisha, we, we don't have the same kind of cognitive defects, actually. Energy is a very, very difficult concept to understand. We understand it because we've soaked ourselves in it for years, and we've eventually got around to grasping it. I mean, but it takes time. You can't right. expect people um, who spent all their lives getting elected or the man in the street, woman in the street, who are too busy looking after their families to spend hours studying thermodynamics. You right. can't expect them to grasp this. It's a really strange idea. I mean, energy, let's not forget, is a really new idea in natural science. It's a, it's a mid 19th century idea. It hasn't really sunk in yet, even in public discourse. And certainly, cognitively, we just don't understand the quality aspect of energy. We have some intuitions about quantity, because it's a little bit like food. Right. Uh, but unhelpful intuitions in some senses because fossil fuels look like dangerous food. They don't look like nutritious food, uh, which is, so it's a clouding of our perception there, which is on. So yes, education, but let's be realistic about this. It's going to be very difficult to it educate. Won't. Yes. Uh, and I think we, we're better off really by showing uh, in very simple terms that the policies are failing as climate policy. They're harming human welfare because of the low productivity. Some of the complex arguments about thermodynamics and indeed exposing the energy blindness, as Deborah Lieberman calls it, the, the energy blindness that we all have, is a very large part of it. Saying so don't be confident about your decisions, decision makers, because you're energy blind. You really don't understand energy at all. And I, I think that could help, actually, rather than having to tell senators that they're stupid, which may sometimes be true, of course, but well, it's not very tactful to say that. You can say, Senator, you're energy blind like the rest of us. Wake up. Try to grip the grips with a little bit of the science here, because then you may suddenly realize that the confidence you had in renewables is utterly misplaced, and very simple thermodynamic reasoning will show you that this is just not going to deliver a society which is robust, defensible, and enduring. Um, well, I think energy blindness is a great term, and I saw that in your papers because uh, I talk about you know energy illiteracy and just the lack of we don't have enough of it, and we need to be talking about it more. Um, and obviously, I, you know, I specialize in U.S. shale, but I cover everything from China and geopolitics, and 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 it's sort of just you know, it's taking time to bring it all together and explain it to folks um, and, and businesses. I mean, the clients that I actually work with, you have to walk them through. Everybody has to sort of do this, but it's an appreciation that energy is so interrelated to everything else, especially... Well, it is everything, in <clears throat> fact. Right. I mean, energy is just the theory of how we change the world. Right. You know, the purpose is not to observe the world, but to change it, said Marx. Marx is not wrong about everything. You know, it gives an Englishman a great pleasure to say that. In <laughs> um, it, it's great fun. Uh, but that's correct. Yeah, and everything you see around you, all the items of wealth in the economy, these are changes to the world. And they're changes away from thermodynamic equilibrium towards improbability, you know, very, very unlikely states of affairs. You need energy to do that because energy is change. It's not a thing. Oil and gas are things, they're substances. Energy is a characteristic of things, and it's their capacity to cause changes in the world. So it's a, it's a subtle concept, energy. Uh, it's a mathematical abstraction, in fact. It's just the way we understand the potential to cause change, which is why economists are so wrong when they say that energy is just another input. Oh, they're very it's, wrong. It's not an input at all, mm, right. actually. Uh, it's a characteristic of all inputs. Everything you see around you has these sorts of has this particular qualitative characteristic right. of improbability. So uh, you don't get away from energy. You can't substitute for it. You can substitute for oil, you can substitute for gas or coal, but you can't substitute for energy. You're always 100% dependent on energy. And that's why, historically, and I'm partly a philosopher and partly a historian, of course, so um, I say this, people say very frequently, modern societies are more dependent on energy than previous societies. It's untrue. All human societies, all organisms right. actually, are 100% dependent on energy because we're dependent on changing the world and indeed maintaining 
our own bodies, changing the world to right. make and maintain our own bodies, we're always 100% dependent, never more, never less. Um, valid, very valid points. Um, so I think fr from there, okay, so if we're talking about, you know, this energy blindness and, and explaining this, I think there's there's two tracks. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't get a lot of buy-in from everybody on this, but, you know, energy and geopolitics are highly interconnected and yeah, related. Absolutely. And um, I do think it is a, it's this part of this education piece of, you know, I would like to know a little bit about, because the U.S. and China are two big components to this for Europe, um, but I'd like to understand, you know, how well do people in Europe and European policymakers understand what's, understand the U.S., understand U.S. shale gas, understand, you know, shale oil and how much we have, because I think one of the big issues that we, <clears throat> at least in the beginning points of trying to get LNG liquefied natural gas off to Japan was was Japan just getting comfortable and Asia just getting comfortable with how much shale did how much gas do we actually have and and we know that we have a lot we have you know we have decades and decades and decades we have plenty of, of natural gas I'm very very confident of that um, and anyone in Liberty or, or anyone at, at any of these oil companies in town would would validate that so in the US we're not concerned about that but um, I'm just curious as to you know we have tons of it if we could build a pipeline um, and and continue our exports we have we're gonna have 16 billion cubic feet per day of capacity next year um, and we're producing we're our gross withdrawals are nearly 120 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas. That's over a quarter of the global, you know, supply and demand for natural gas. So the U.S.'s ability to move the needle is pretty significant. And yeah. I'm curious as to how well that is, is that understood? Is that known well, near? What, not, what is the thought about that? Uh, well, what I learned from that is that there is a God and he's been listening to all those songs you <laughs> sing and he really has blessed America. Uh, yes, of course, we know that. Uh, in principle. A lot of people in the U.K., the man in the street doesn't necessarily know it. Uh, and indeed, we have a lot of shale gas too, probably. In the UK, but we're refusing right. to use it at the moment, or uh, that, that will change. You lift those bans on and off all. Uh, left, yes, it yeah. seems to be sort of uh, whatever an incoming prime minister does to get a yes. headline. Um, but that there will be shale gas exploration in the UK at some point. I mean, I'm here to look at fracking. Right. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm here. I, not just to talk to people, but uh, also to see what, what's going on and learn more about it, because I want to write something which gives more information. Right. Probably well, we're going to help do, you with that. We're going to do that at yeah. some point uh, because we must. You know, these high-grade fuels, they're going to be used. Um, as yet, we don't know. Perhaps there's some hidden obstacle to actually uh, exploiting that resource in the UK. I doubt it. I suspect right. it's going to be handy. Now, you have a lot, certainly. Um, the expectation is that, uh, clearly, uh, the White House expectation at the moment is that demand in the US will fall because you're going to have so much wind and solar, uh, which will be a disaster for you. And you're going to export a lot of your production of oil and gas, so your production won't fall as fast as your consumption because you're going to be exporting it. Well, will it come to Europe? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, the Europeans are determined not to use uh, as much, of course, themselves in the future. Right. So the likeliest uh, consumer, it seems to me, for your oil and gas is going to be Asia. Um, are you going to be happy with handing a geopolitical ace to your consumers in Asia? Because they're going to be able to use those fuels to create improbable states of matter which suit their own ends. They're not going to just, not just consumer toys for Westerners but uh, they're going to be putting them into productive plant and indeed military materiel in Asia. And so they should. It's an entirely rational thing to do. Right. Uh, and I feel that a lot of this comes down to the nature of the people in our government tiers. Um, American government is full of lawyers. Uh, the Chinese government is full of engineers. And they see the world very differently. And that helps the UK government too, full of lawyers, really don't understand the difference between a megawatt and a megawatt hour, let alone eat all the subtleties we've discussed elsewhere uh, in, in this podcast. Well, you know, I think so. You bring up the Asia thing. I, I um, I do, th I do, I do not actually think that LNG companies right now should be getting into bed. Um, and I'm very vocal about this, public or non-public, doesn't matter. If you're signing long-term contracts with China, um, it's not the right call. Um, history would have told you that in, in Europe, in places. I mean, this is a, a country that is we're going. It's a, it's a downhill trajectory, and um, it's sort of like we just Huawei and ZTE. I mean, I know we still have Huawei in, in certain places um, in the U.S., but thankfully we, we've gotten we've basically put a ban on ZTE and Hikvision as well, which is great um, here in the U.S. But these are really serious things. So if if your company, just from a, a uh, economic standpoint, and um, if your company in the U.S. and you are signing contracts with China, you need to be checking yourself and having a really different China strategy because it's it's kind of sort of like uh, doing this with Iran. I mean, that's the direction this is going. But the difficulties of the U.S. are extreme here because China's productive capacity is now so very, very large, and it's happened so tremendously quickly that I think it's not really appreciated. No, uh, it's it's uh, it's not a, it's not appreciated. And the productive capacity is huge, but I think, and this this is such a great point about China, but. 
because it's so intertwined with Europe. And I mean, it's so intertwined with green and energy policy and, and China spends a, just like Russia spent a lot of money in Europe on you know, the anti-fracking movement and funding Gasland and movie theaters in, in France and, and really propelling you know, anti-fracking um, in Europe to push Europeans away from natural gas. China has spent a massive amount of money and the IEA admits this of, of promoting climate change, not necessarily addressing climate change, promoting the issues of climate change. It suits them. And it suits them. I mean, they're invested in the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is now endorsed by the UN as the Green Belt and Road, as the Sustainable Development Initiative with the UN. Um, they, they've pushed within this whole COP27 to have you know the developed world pay for the developing world's energy transition with wind and solar, and lo and behold, those come from China. Mm -hmm. So China wants all the checks written from the developed world to them to sell out this wind and solar and um, and to put it into these, Af these African and developing countries. Um, and it benefits China greatly. China has done nothing. I mean, we're talking nothing. Um, they are not committed to CO2 emission reduction. They are not committed to climate policy. Anything China does is for the benefit of China. Which is entirely rational. Why Which is entirely Why aren't we being as reasonable? I mean, yes, it's quite true. That, they're uh, very sustain Yeah, they're, they're, their grid is is their grid is is coal and renew. I mean, when they build out renewables, they build them in tandem with coal. These are window dressings, really. I mean, the, the, the difficulty that Europeans have with the Chinese adoption of renewables is that the scales are so different. So uh, a European uh, observer might say, "Oh, look, they've just built ten or." 25 gigawatts of wind, and in the European context that sounds like a lot, but in the Chinese context it's a drop in a right. ocean. Right. It's nothing to them. This right. is a very, very cheap gesture. Uh, window dressing for selling uh, the products. They're interested in selling wind and solar turbines to our, uh, wind, sorry, wind turbines and solar PV cells to us. They're not really interested in adopting them for themselves. Right. They wish to use thermodynamically superior fuels, Absolutely. and so should we. Uh, the question, therefore, is really not why the, are they doing what they're doing. The question is why aren't we being as rational and doing something similar? The problem is ours, not theirs. They're being entirely rational. They're building industrial capacity within China. They're developing their infrastructure. They're doing what the industrial world in Europe did in the end of the 19th century and the 20th century. Uh, why are we not actually learning the lessons of our own history and persisting in using high-grade fuels to repair the complexity, the very complex societies that we've created? The puzzle is us. Why are we making a mistake? I, I agree that there are problems with China. Um, I'm reluctant to suggest that this is a, a large-scale conspiracy. I take the view that uh, encapsulated in Napoleon's uh, expression, that when you see your opponent making a mistake, don't interrupt him. We're making a mistake. The Chinese are not interrupting us. Very sensible of them. Uh, so, I mean, I'll, I'll, we can agree to disagree. Um, I do not think China's rise is peaceful. I don't think it's conspiracy at all. I mean, I've spent a, a great deal of time studying it. Um, I think they're, you know, they are 100% a threat to most of the Western democracies for a number of different reasons. And I think that just their sheer, from an energy standpoint, coal generation alone, when, you, when you've ramped up 100 tr you know, million tons, of, when you've ramped up production of coal to the extent that China has in the last five years, it's not for kicks and giggles. Um, it, energy security is a really big deal. Yeah. Energy security allows you significant flexibility internally and externally. Um, and yes, so just from a realist standpoint, if you're war gaming, yes. it's, it's something that should like be thought of. Like it or of, not, so. they are certainly uh, a threat. Right. But, right. but from an energy standpoint, it's, my point is that, you know, They've added, um, and not efficiently, I mean, the Chinese energy system and, and many things that China does are, is not efficient. Their solar panels are not even efficient. I mean, they have, we have lots of issues of, of batteries, solar panels, all kinds of things. But from a coal standpoint, you know, they have over 5,000 terawatt hours of coal-fired power generation. They've added over 1,000 terawatt hours just last year alone, which is more than all of the U.S.'s coal-fired power generation. Mm. All of it. They've added in one year. So when we talk about, you know, where we're buying our, our green energy from and, and trying to reduce our CO2 emissions and kill ourselves in individual states, you know, we really have to appreciate that global CO2 emissions are not declining. And so mm. the only, unless you're willing, and I, I, I think, and I say this, and I don't mean this in a callous way, but unless you're willing to go to war with China, you know, to reduce CO2 emissions, it's probably not going to happen. And all these things that when we don't ha take care of our, uh, to your point, of when we don't take care of our internal issues and our economic stability, we're increasing uh, the ability to, we're actually increasing CO2 emissions because every, the lack of energy security, the lack of producing energy within Europe 
um, helped contribute, uh, and getting it all from Russia, um, helped contribute to the current energy situation. And now that uh, now we have CO two emission rising because you're using diesel and you're using and you're using coal, greater greater components of coal. So the U S. I mean, has able been able to reduce CO two emissions because we have. And and I, again, I think the CO two emissions is all for naught. But that trajectory has been downward because we've used our own natural gas and and you've deindustrialized actually and deindu and you know, yeah. massive deindustrialization here in comparative certainly absolutely um, energy consumption uh, in industry in the US has been falling for some years and uh, it's continued and, and even more worryingly I and mean, I should be talking about this in the lecture I'm about to give actually here in Denver that uh, not only is energy consumption in industry falling in the US but it's actually de-electrifying and that's I think that's even more significant in one sense because Electrical conversion processes in manufacturing, these are high grade processes, right. very precision manufacturing, right. so uh, very high temperatures but very small quantities of energy, that sort of thing. Uh, that's worrying. You're, you're moving towards simpler forms of manufacturing. So competition with China has driven you into Absolutely. cruder manufacturing. Yeah. Less of it and cruder. You look at the curves for China, it's electrifying. Mm -hmm. Not only enormously increased right. consumption total, but hugely increased electrification. So it's now actually, although you, can, you commented on the inefficiencies in China, well, a system that large Absolutely. is going Absolutely. to have a lot of inefficiencies. Right. But they're, they're really obviously now a very high-grade economy. I and they're building... They what you're explaining is they they have the energy to build very important the, the, to manufacture they things to build anything. stuff. Yes, well, I mean, you know, it, the idea that somehow China isn't an unsophisticated economy is absurd. I mean, you know, the components the, of it that aren't, they're, they're, some, they're, aren't. some aren't. Yeah. I mean, they're able to make uh, all the laptops and iPhones Absolutely. that we require, and we can't build those ourselves. Actually, uh, we find it very difficult to do so from scratch tomorrow. Uh, that. So I, I, I think that the. You, you suggest we'd have to go to war with China to save the planet in terms of CO2. No, I mean, we're not, I didn't even we're not in a position no. to go to war with China. I mean, I, I don't mean to save the planet because I actually don't think that's why I say the CO2 emission conversation has to be set aside. But I, I say it to get people to realize that if you're really, if you're that hell bent on reducing CO2, you would have to have a conversation about, go, you know, dealing with China. And I don't think there's no one comfortable doing that. But no. that, that you, you're. Well, point we're clearly not serious about reducing CO2 at right. the global level. I right. mean, if we really were serious, we wouldn't be doing any of the stuff we're currently Absolutely. doing. Yeah. Actually, so, any of it, we'd be doing a, a disciplined in gas to nuclear trajectory. So right. we'd be working really hard to improve the thermal efficiency of combined cycle gas turbines. You'd be encouraging their adoption worldwide, and you'd be encouraging um, high, high tech nuclear, both for heat and electricity. It's not just electricity, you know, high temperature heat for industrial conversion processes. And you'd be encouraging that de deployment of that safely and securely around the world. Right. But we're not doing any of that. We're doing renewables, which clearly tells you this is a displacement activity. Uh, over lobbied, yes, by vested interest and also by the green NGOs who've been utterly irresponsible about this. Right, right. Utterly irresponsible. If they really cared about the planet, why are they recommending renewables, really? So I think we should close this um, by talking about, uh, as you point out, the Inflation Reduction Act and, mm -hmm. and the US. Um, and I think you've listened to the podcast and um, folks, my clients and, and presentations give, I mean, I, I would be critical if, if of Trump and previous administrations, if they had done energy policies like this, I would, I would be critical of them. Um, but this administration, I am very critical of from an energy policy standpoint. Um, there's a few things on China, I'm actually, I'm. I'm Absolutely, I think it's great, um, but m almost on energy and a lot of economics, Inflation Reduction Act certainly being one of them is that, but this is a very anti-domestic oil and gas production administration. Um, whether they've curbed production is a, is a different story, but whether they've enabled it is, they, they have not enabled production, they have canceled, you know, we don't have federal lease sales. Um, we, the Climate Change Executive Order 14008 has had a profound impact on not just the trying to force renewables into the grid, but in terms of pausing all lease sales on, on federal land, and then we have a a, a pretty rampant decline in federal permits that are being actively approved. Mm -hmm. If a federal permit expires, you cannot get it reapproved. That's never happened in a previous administration. Um, and so it's, it's, and we have all these, you know, Biden gets on TV, you know, on a nearly uh, pre midterms, on a nearly weekly basis to sort of rip on the industry and write letters to, to companies and everything. So that's sort of the backdrop with this. Um, and we have a, obviously, this Inflation Reduction Act, which Unfortunately, you know, um, Joe Manchin did not help anyone out there and he went along with it. Um, and it, the fact that it's called inflation reduction and there's so much spending, um, and especially so much spending on, on the climate side. Well, nearly all of it, actually. Yeah. I mean, there's hardly anything else. Like, why no. don't they call it the climate change and renewables? Act? Because they knew that it would, would be harder to get through. It would so, be harder to get through. Absolutely. Well, I, when I saw that. Yeah, so uh, love your. Yeah, I know you've I mean, got lots of thoughts on it, so I, have at it. Well, I'm a European, so uh, I, I looked at this and thought, oh, this is our, this is our, these are our policies. 
Uh, that's striking because the failure of the European policies is absolutely manifest to anybody who's uh, candid with themselves about it. Why haven't you learned? Right. All you had to do was look to see. The data is not hard to get. You know, we've been publishing this stuff pretty actively. You know, why are you going ahead with this? And the scale of the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is quite extraordinary. I know the, the subsidies and the direct and the federal spending, yes, they're hundreds of billions of dollars, and that's very serious. It's going to be very you know, bad for taxpayers, these tax credits, right. which you, you know, you'd much rather uh, not pay. Right. Um, but the real impact here, and, we, and this is where I went immediately, because we know this in Europe from ex bitter experience, the real cost is the opportunity cost of the capital which is moved by those subsidies. So the Inflation Reduction Act subsidies direct are in the hundreds of billions, but the capex which is motivated by that runs into the trillions on wind and solar and associated grid improvements and that all takes place in under a decade. The opportunity cost is absolutely vast for the American people. These, these are the capital movements, capex that you might want to spend on Absolutely. schools, hospitals, roads, right. or indeed having a functioning defence service, uh, rather than one which will be progressively diminished. You can't afford this, actually. You're now in what effect, you know, China is going to do to you what uh, you did Absolutely. to the Russians. They will tempt you into yep. an arms race which they can afford, right. and you absolutely cannot, as you stand, cannot, and with the Inflation Reduction Act, you will become an indefensible state. Why on earth are you doing this? Well, you know, I think there's a number of different reasons of, you know, the stuff in it. A lot of people make a lot of money when you spend a lot of money. Vested in interests, yes, yes. Right. And so that's, it's an ill wind that blows no good know, to somebody. Quite right. Yeah. So it's, it's very frustrating within Congress. And, I, and, it, and truthfully, you don't have enough. The intellectual capacity of a lot of folks inside the interworkings of this isn't there. Um, the energy intel within the White House is, is very, very limited, you know. Most of us can admit that Joe Biden probably isn't making the big decisions. Yeah. So there's. But I, don't, I don't blame him or his team. Actually, I mean, going no, back no, to the no, no. Biden's point. It, right, inflation yeah. reduction. Yeah. This is this is Congress. Yeah. Now he signed this and pushed this. So, but the point is, is that no, I, I don't think there's a. I don't think there's deep intellectual capacity, and I've been vocal about this within the administration on energy. Period. And yeah. I've known this from you know they they. They didn't know where they were sort of stood on LNG. They didn't really know where they stood on gas, and and they haven't made. They just haven't been clear on it. They have some people there that the former industry, but clearly have they haven't made a lot of inroads in that. And that's because they then they very much believe in in and you know climate change and doing exactly what China or uh, sorry exactly what Europe did is outsourcing your CO2 emissions to, or outsourcing it to someone else, even though we produce all of it, and that's handing your geopolitical leverage away. This Inflation Reduction Act, though, in terms of the spending, one, the spending is just a, bag, a big problem to begin with. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you have a more, in, in Europe, and it's particularly in England, you have a central bank that calls out your, you know, got rid of your, basically caused your prime minister, Liz Truss, to, to lose her job within weeks mm -hmm. because she said she was going to increase spending. Here in America, our Congress and White House spent hundreds of trillion, you know, spent hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars, and um, that rescue package at the beginning of the White of this administration caused at least three percent in a three percent to the current inflation figure. That's massive. And yet, when Jerome Powell, our chairman of Federal Reserve, was asked if you know, what about fiscal, what about fiscal spending and how is that impacting you know inflation, he basically dodged the question and didn't want to talk about it. It's a really serious issue when your government is continuing to spend like crazy and driving up inflation and your monetary policy is trying to drive it down. And so this Inflation Reduction Act, I know Europe is actually pretty angry about this because we're, the subsidies we have on, on renewables, on batteries and things is going to basically... They're higher than ours, so you're going to right. be drawing the industry. Right. In so then, and then this comes from China. And we do have bans on imports from Xinjiang. So we have some very serious big problems. Now, the one benefit to this is I don't, I, one executive order, 1408, all of, all of Trump's executive orders were kiboshed um, when Biden came into office. Biden had more executive orders than any previous, in, in his first few months than any president in history. And, um, you know, those will be kiboshed by the next president. You know, executive orders come and go. And so much has been built around the executive orders on climate change and pushing all these renewables into the grid. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's 2035. And, I think uh, Volkov Smil, who helps influence that J.P. Morgan report that, um, that that Michael and Blank Anna's last name that does every year. It's um, a very good study. It's, uh, but they point out very specifically, the U.S. does not have the legal framework. We do not have the legal 
capacity to actually build the transmission lines. So we can subsidize and we can buy all this stuff. It will never get built. It will never actually get into the grid because unlike China, we will not flatten, you know, we will not cover mountainsides and flatten, you know, yeah. places and build all this stuff out. So the attempt will be there. And I think it will begin breaking down from, and the cost standpoint, I mean, I, Yes, we didn't have the we have we have a split Congress now, um, and as the economy as the economy declines, um, you have a point in the, in the Crown about this. As you know, as the economy declines, spending gets people get people get more concerned about spending, and our, the economies around the world are declining. So we haven't spent we the may money not yet. Be able to afford the renewables. Right. So we haven't spent the money yet, and inflation is there, and we're doing this, but it's already facing it's already however, facing issues. However, a warning from Europe. Uh, yes, we, we thought that subsidiarity, the division between the member states would put the brakes on the green policies. It never really happened, actually. That I uh, never really acted to protect national interests in the same way. So I wouldn't rely on subsidiarity in the US to prevent the federal government being able to push this through. The creation of vested interests within the oh, states absolutely. may be sufficient to absolutely. actually overcome that. What about so on a sta states, though? Individual states? Individual states? Well, let's hope so. But I really think you shouldn't rely on uh, spontaneous uh, resistance to these policies. You, we have to. Be oh, no, no, no. We have to be pushing back. Uh, we have to be pushing back. Absolutely not. As hard as we possibly hence, can. Hence why we, and why I yeah. want to spend more time in DC on this. So you're you're 100 percent right. Um, I just think it's also you know. So you're right about that. But the implementation, I think, is it could be very difficult. Really, the implementation was very difficult in Europe too. We had enormous resistance to the application of onshore wind in the UK, and I was a large part of that. And that's been just been overruled. But in spite of all this resistance, there was still an awful lot of renewables built, enough to damage the economies. The point is that you, the, the IRA doesn't have to be fulfilled in total for it to be devastating right. to the, the US. So you mustn't even try. Uh, you know, that you destabilize the superior fuel sector simply by attempting to do these things, even if you don't succeed. So the failure itself may be enough to damage you fatally. It's very important to prevent the attempt to realize the IRA. It, yes, I agree, it won't happen, uh, but the damage from the attempt may be very large. So you've left us with several lessons, which is, um, which is, uh, ener or you said, not energy literacy. Energy um, blindness. Energy blindness. Um, you, you mentioned fight and continue fighting hard and, um, you know, calling, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act what it actually is and educate and explain to people. All these very valid points coming from, um, uh, you know, somebody who knows the energy space extremely well in Europe and the sort of what not to do. Um, I have to ask you, given that I have you here and everyone knows I'm a, I'm a hawk on China. Um, and before we close, you know, there is some interesting stuff going on within the UK in terms of the rhetoric on China. I know that uh, your Prime Minister Richie Sunak actually um, spoke yesterday and had a much, he didn't call China a threat, although you have various agencies within the UK mm. all calling China a threat. Um, but you, he talked about it differently and um, he basically said it's a, you know, a rival, um, in a different way, in a, in a rival, and and did talk about uh, democracy, and did talk about how spending money in China isn't just going to change, you know, the political circumstances, and we have to we have to realize that what we've done for the past thirty years isn't sort of working. So, one, I thought that was healthy just to say it, um, but two, um, you know, you you went on the UK uh, agreed, and a lot of countries actually went on the bandwagon with the US on banning Huawei, which I think from a security standpoint that was great. But the UK still has a, and I don't know where this has been, you, where this is at right now, but the, the your nuclear facility, Hinkley, mm. um, being the Chinese are helping you build that. And size will see too, actually, um, so the two large nuclear plants. Right, so that seems to be a, just, even if it's not China, let's, any country, outside of sort of the US and Canada or a very friendly country mm. that you recognize, that seems to be not very uncomfortable from a geopolitical point of why would we allow a country that doesn't have rule of law and we don't have control over to help well, to help us build this nuclear facility? I think we can both of us agree that nuclear long term is a very sensible. Thing Absolutely, to nuclear is. Fossil to nuclear is very sensible, but the global nuclear industry at the moment is dominated by Russia and by China. Then most of the construction is taking place in those countries. So if you are trying to uh, rebuild your own nuclear fleet, some exposure to those countries is almost inevitable. I mean, you want less and less of it, probably, for reasons of national security. But it's going to be very difficult to achieve. I, the difficulty of unwinding the relationship with China is going to be extremely painful, yes. actually. And uh, not least because, in some senses, it's going to make friction with China even worse. We want a peaceful relationship with China, ultimately. We don't want a major global war with this state. It would be very bad for everyone. We want a lot of things in the world, but it's, it's yes, harder it, to, it, it, may, it may happen anyway, let's you know, pray God not. But uh, we want a stable and peaceful relationship with China. Achieving that is going to be difficult uh, because, after all, we have history 
uh, which we've forgotten, Chinese have not. And you know, the century of humiliation is very real to them. Uh, you ask uh, the average Englishman, Englishwoman, say, why do you think the Chinese are uh, so suspicious and hostile of Britain? They say they really haven't a clue, got a clue. Is it something to do with Hong Kong? But no. It's the Opium War, it's the burning of the Summer Palace in 1860. They've forgotten that a British army, a French and German army, sacked Peiping in 1900 in the bottom of the There's an excellent book called uh, The Good War. Um, yeah. That's a, a recent book on China revisionists uh, on World War II, but anyways, yes. continue. I mean, listen, we, we needn't dig into the wrongs and rights Absolutely. of each of these things. The fact is they are live issues for uh, Chinese people at the moment. They remember them, they resent them. And so there is a certain sort of revenge, feeling of revenge there. So and this is the political reality. It's going to be difficult to stabilize this. Is it impossible? I hope not. I mean, you, but do you think you can, um, very difficult, do you think there's ways that that will be rolled back to to a sort of recognition this is a national security issue you know we have we can't we are a democratic liberal democracy we're a western democracy we have serious issues of human rights and serious issues that world war ii lessons in china we can't sort of accept that no, the basic I, things like national security of this nuclear facility that we sort of have to figure out a way to roll it back That's we have to figure be. out a way to roll it back absolutely we have to do that i let's be realistic about this in, in relation to chinese interests if the West is weak, China will have to expand to fill that vacuum. Yep. Even if they have doubts about doing so, Absolutely. they will have to do it. Yep. So one of the best things that we can do in the interest of the Chinese people and our own people is to remain strong. Absolutely. Because then it becomes rational for the Chinese government not to try to expand into an empty space that would be occupied. And with luck, the situation in China itself will develop and we'll see a much less aggressive uh, overseas policy from China. But it's all dependent on what the West does. We can't expect China to reform itself without ourselves actually remaining strong and capable of defending our own interests. That's so to the point of producing our own energy. Well, and not just our own energy. You can have all the wind farms you like and it's, no, still, I mean, it's still I mean, low quality energy. Yes, I mean producing high our quality high energy. quality and high quality is, energy. This is why I say producing our, you know, producing our own in, in America and, and helping export it to, to Europe is a well, Europe huge... Well, Europe has a lot of fossil fuels too, actually. Absolutely, you we do? Are, yes, quite a lot. You do. And we're, we're just not using them. Not enough to become energy or target. We're, we're happy to help you with that. Yes, you know, I mean, that's, yeah. that, I'm sure you would be. And I'd like to see it too, and it will probably happen. No, and, I, and I, we, we, I mean that in, the, in a really credible way. Of I think you, Europe is rich in natural resources, um, and we have a massive amount of knowledge here in the U.S. Um, mm. The ability to sort of help in a in a way that we've we do it well. We have very high sta we have our highest NOx and SOx emission standards in the world. Um, yeah. We have very high air quality standards. So actually, here in Colorado, which you'll see on a, on a, I believe you're taking a frac tour tomorrow. I mean, we have very some of the most stringent air quality standards in, in the in the world is here in Colorado. So the ability to frac here, this is sort of if you want to know how to do it and do it well, this is this is uh, you know sort well, of it. I, I'm sure that um, U.S. companies are going to be involved in fracking when it takes place in Europe. Though I expect to see a uh, very rapid development of uh, European fracking industry too, after all we saw it in the North Sea uh, there. I'm sure this is going to happen. When it happens is crucial. Uh, we, there's not a minute to lose. I, the, the points that I've been trying to make in my papers about the creation of wealth, these are sophisticated arguments, of course, they're quite subtle too, is that when societies start to decay, it becomes very difficult to arrest that decay and you lose important elements of tradition. The nuclear industry, is act we were just talking about it, it's a very interesting example of this. I used to be a fellow of Cambridge College, and I said to one of the senior nuclear engineers sitting next to me at dinner one night, why is it, Bob, that you're the only nuclear engineer I meet? And he said, well, um, there are just none of us left. You know, there are no young nuclear engineers. So that continuity has been broken. Absolutely. And yeah, there is a that's danger, a very good point. There is a danger that policies such as the Inflation Reduction Act will cause an interruption in the intellectual continuity, the engineering continuity in your own fossil fuel mm -hmm. industry. So it's already, no, it's already, it's already, it's already happening. happening. Very, it's already it's happening. Very, very valid point, which yeah. is which is why the industry not I mean has to has to advocate for themselves yes. of saying and making sure you're recruiting these engineers and I yeah. said this in uh, um, I mean I've said this my entire career um, and I have a business called Petronerds which many think is a bit crazy especially you know like there's a few people that criticize it but you know what I do pretty quickly mm -hmm. and when I'm working with government agencies and stuff it's always really interesting because um, people sort of understand the term once once they meet me but I say two things and that's that look there's going to be about 12 people or one thing that there's going to be about 12 people that understand hydrocarbons you know in 10 years from now and geopolitics and I certainly intend to be one of them and I think we've seen 
we saw at the beginning of my career in 2010 in DC, the decline in uh, knowledge of sort of hydrocarbons and geopolitics mm -hmm. because it was sort of just going out of fashion and people weren't doing it. And I think it's, and this goes to nuclear and engineering to all your points is that, you know, it's extremely important that these fields of knowledge that yes. have to be maintained. Well, it's, it's not widely appreciated, I think, the general public. The, the fossil fuel industry is an intellectual creation. You know, I'm, I'm a uh, lapsed Cambridge intellectual. So I appreciate the sophistication of the industry as soon as I see it. You don't digging behind the industry, you find there's an enormous academic literature about the yes. geology. Oh, oh you know, yes, it's, it's vast it's, and it's, it's very sophisticated yeah, indeed. It's really, but it's quite easy to lose the ability to read that literature. So the knowledge absolutely. could be lost quite yep. quickly. And it's very important that that isn't lost. Breaches in intellectual continuity are national disasters. Yep. Actually, it, uh, the breach in nuclear continuity in the UK is a national disaster. It's not widely appreciated, but it really is. I mean, we were right at the forefront of the industry at the beginning, and now we're yep. do, we're customers, which hence, is very disappointing. Hence the China, hence and, the, yeah. And yes, and you you become dependent on other countries for supplying Absolutely. technology. That could even happen in the U.S. And it really, could. No, yeah, people say to me, does oil and gas have a long-term future in the U.S.? And the answer is, yes, of course it does. These are superior fuels. But American companies may not be the companies extracting it. American consumers may not be the consumers actually using those high-grade fields. That kind of outcome has to be avoided. Well, with that uh, warning um, to America, I think we should we should close this podcast. And uh, you are not the only uh, British intellectual that I've met recently that has had these, uh, you know, sort of warnings of to the U.S. Of, of not to lose the capacity in this industry, um, not just for our own sake, but for the rest of the world. So I, um, John Constable, Dr. John Constable, it was a pleasure to have you on the Great podcast. Great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Trisha. Um, thank you so much.